Good morning, this is Mike DeLaCluse with Lessman Instruments. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for Introduction to Fuel Trains 101 by Lessman's own combustion specialist, A.J. Piscor. Today, A.J. is going to cover how NFPA dictates which components to use in your fuel train assemblies and why. He will also talk about some of the best practices, valve proving versus vent valves, and leak testing of shutoff valves. AJ joined Lessman as our combustion and control specialist after spending 10 years with our manufacturer partner Maxon, now a Honeywell company, as a sales engineer. He holds an aeronautical engineering degree from University of Minnesota, where the Chicago Blackhawks are going to play the Minnesota Wild an outdoor game this Sunday. We will be muting the phone lines. If you have any questions, there's a question tool built into GoToWebinar. Please send me the questions and I'll have AJ answer them. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to AJ. All right. Thank you, Mike, and good morning to all of you. So today we're going to cover just a couple of topics as it relates to fuel trains. We'll talk about the components uh, that go within the fuel train as well as the arrangement of those components. Uh, at each component level, I'll talk about best practices based on my experience from what I see for each of those components. Uh, um, we'll also go a little bit into uh, valve proving versus vent valve. It's a relatively new concept for fuel trains, as well as uh, leak testing for shutoff valves. And of course, uh, we'll uh, we'll save some time at the end for your questions. Uh, Mike's going to be monitoring the chat session on the webinar. So if you have any questions and you want him to interrupt me and cover something, uh, just let him know, and we'll go from there. Uh, just a quick unsolicited plug for NFPA. Uh, all of my information that I've got, the majority of this for the presentation, comes from the uh, NFPA 86 standard for ovens and furnaces. Uh, their 2015 edition is the most recent edition that's available. You can go on to nfpa.org and you can search their online catalog for that, uh, for that standard. And it's, uh, it's about $60. Uh, for a downloadable PDF or the hard copy book. And if you're a member of NFPA, you can save 10%. So as we go into the, uh, the definition uh, and, and the themes within NFPA 86, uh, we, I, you see a lot of things under the different categories that seem One of the things is that uh, they always say that devices that you use shall be intended for the service, uh, and shall be listed for the service intended, rather. So, for instance, you can't use a switch that's only rated uh, as, a, as an air switch uh, on, your, on your gas line. And all of the devices shall be applied and installed in accordance to the manufacturer's instructions. Uh, same goes for any kind of maintenance that would be required for that component. As you read through the code, you'll see these themes repeated uh, often. Um, NFPA doesn't want to take responsibility for the, for the maintenance or the service of the individual, individual components, so they'll always defer to the manufacturer. Uh, so what is the purpose of the fuel train? So the main purpose of the fuel train is to safely introduce and interrupt the fuel supply to the burner, and it does this by regulating the fuel pressure, so controlling the amount of fuel pressure that enters and exits the fuel train, uh, monitors the fuel pressure. This is done via uh, pressure switches and turning the fuel on and off. So this is done either by the safety shutoff valves automatically, which tie into the burner management system, or through uh, various manual isolation valves. Here I show a diagram of what I would consider to be a standard fuel train arrangement. Uh, so we have the fuel inlet on the top left side of the diagram coming in from the top and going down. And then it takes a 90-degree uh, turn, and it goes from the left to the right. I show a split between the uh, pilot and the main. And in the, in the main arrangement, uh, I have a couple of extra components in there. I've got our pressure switches and also a vent valve between the blocking valves. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on the arrangement of those components uh, in, later on in the presentation. Um, there's a couple things that I don't show uh, in this fuel train arrangement. Uh, most of your fuel trains will have uh, pressure gauges. Uh, those are um, good devices to use to give you a uh, rough approximation of the pressure in the line at that point. Uh, but I 
did not include it because it's not a uh, component that is required uh, by code. And uh, I also don't show a pressure relief valve um, because you're not going to always have a pressure relief valve, but I will talk a little bit about pre the use of pressure relief valves uh, later on in the presentation when I go over regulators. So the first component that I'd like to talk about would be the equipment isolation or our manual shutoff valves. So I've highlighted uh, the, um, the equipment isolation and manual shutoff valves that I have depicted here in the drawing, uh, just for our reference. And uh, NFPA 86 defines an equipment isolation valve as a manual shutoff valve for the shutoff of fuel to each piece of equipment. It also defines an emergency shutoff valve as a manual shutoff valve to allow the fuel to be turned off in an emergency. Uh, I've shown some pictures of some examples of these types of isolation valves. Really the main difference between these two valves is that the equipment isolation valve um, are um, entirely optional in that um, it's just best practice for you to be able to isolate the pilot versus the main or to isolate um, individual components within your gas train. Uh, it's not a necessarily a code requirement, but they just define it as an equipment isolation valve. Uh, the emergency shutoff valve, though, is a code requirement, and one of the things that it details in the code is that this valve has to be located far enough away from the main fuel train and, more importantly, from the combustion system, so the oven, furnace, or dryer. In the case that there is some kind of a fire, um, you want to have this emergency shutoff valve located far enough away so that an operator doesn't have to go into harm's way to try to turn the fuel off in an emergency scenario. So that valve is going to be probably not on the fuel train. It'll be well upstream of the fuel train away from the combustion system. Uh, for both equipment isolation and emergency shutoff, um, they should be readily accessible. That makes sense, right? They're manual, uh, so you want to be able to easily access them uh, if you need to. Um, they should also have a permanently affixed visual indication of the valve position. Uh, so uh, this is usually on the handle of the valve. I think actually the code also goes through and specifies for some of these isolation valves that um, they're uh, a quarter turn valve and that when the handle is parallel to the, uh, to the gas piping that that would indicate that the valve is open and then when it's perpendicular that would indicate that the valve is closed. There are some equipment isolation valves that have removable handles and uh, NFPA also has guidelines for those um, saying that you need to have the handle within I think three feet of the valve. Um, you know, affixed with some kind of a chain so somebody can't take the handle and walk off with it. And you can't put that handle on so that you uh, put the handle on uh, when the valve is closed and have that handle going on parallel to the valve. So there's all sorts of different requirements there for those isolation valves. And also you should be able to operate them from full open to full close and return without the use of any tools. Uh, so in our example diagram, I label the first valve in the line as the equipment isolation. So by definition, this is shutting off the gas to the entire device. So I would, I would have that on the upstream side. And then a good best practice for this equipment isolation valve is to select one that has uh, some kind of a locking mechanism that would allow you to perform lockout, uh, tag out uh, as required at your facility. Uh, then the other valves that I have dictated are just considered manual shutoff valves. Um, they're in strategic locations to assist in either isolation of that line or for leak testing purposes, again, which I'll get into a little bit later. Uh, so the next component that I'd like to talk about a little bit is the uh, sediment trap, or sometimes called a drip, drip leg, and the Y strainer. Uh, these are code requirements. Uh, NFPA 86 uh, dictates that the sediments trap shall have a vertical leg with a minimum length of three pipe diameters or minimum of three inches of the same size as the supply pipe. And if you see in my diagram that I show, uh, that's from the T-fitting to the cap uh, at the bottom. Uh, I think that uh, if you get into applications in other areas, I think Canada requires an even longer uh, drip leg, but at least for NFPA 86, 
Uh, it's three times the pipe diameter with a minimum of uh, three inches if your pipe is an inch or smaller. Um, the main purpose of the strip leg is as the gas comes in from the top, um, the uh, heavy particulate matter or moisture will collect down uh, in the bottom of the drip leg. So this will uh, this is just an easy way to capture any kind of large particulate matter or water uh, that may be present in the fuel supply. Um, a good practice that I've seen in the field um, is if you have a particularly um, dirty or wet fuel and you need to frequently drain that drip leg, some people will put a what's called a blowdown valve, which essentially is just an isolation valve on the at the end of the cap that would just allow you to easily open and close that valve to drain any kind of particulate matter out instead of having to completely undo uh, the cap in the, uh, in the train. And then you can use the assist of the line pressure to help um, push that drip leg uh, clean. Just downstream of that, uh, the code also requires the use of a, of a Y strainer or a gas filter. And really the main purpose of this is to capture any kind of smaller particulate matter that may be, uh, that may have gotten past the drip leg. Uh, these have a, uh, usually a mesh screen and, um, and then in that Y portion of the strainer, uh, you could actually go through and pull out and remove that mesh screen. And there's different, um, there's different uh, types of screens that are available to allow bigger or smaller particulate matter uh, through that screen. And again, uh, just like in the drip leg, we've also seen some customers use another blowdown valve just to um, provide an easy method of uh, purging that, uh, that strainer or filter. Uh, so now moving forward, we'll talk a little bit more about pressure leg regulators. And this serves one of the uh, more important functions within the fuel train as far as uh, maintaining a consistent pressure uh, uh, in the fuel train. Uh, so I'm just going to go over a quick uh, couple of definitions because NFPA defines four different types of pressure regulators. Uh, so the first one is a line pressure regulator. Uh, so this is a pressure regulator placed in a gas line between the service regulator and the appliance and equipment regulator. So this is usually in a combustion system or on an oven or a furnace or a dryer. It's traditionally that last regulator that's that's in the line, the ones that I depicted in our diagram. Uh, there's another type of regulator called a monitoring pressure regulator. And uh, and as you can see by the description, it's a regulator in a non-regulated state and set in series with another pressure regula regulator for the purpose of automatically taking over in an emergency control of the pressure downstream of the regulator. Uh, so this is an extra regulator that's used uh, not as a process-related function, but more as a safety-related function for the, uh, uh, essentially in, in the case of an emergency where you have an issue with, uh, with one of the other regulators. A uh, series pressure regulator is sometimes, I, I call it a knockdown regulator. It's a pressure regulator in series with one service line or line pressure regulator. Uh, so I'm taking this, you know, there's going to be a regulator upstream and a regulator downstream, and I want to try to create some kind of an intermediate pressure drop, uh, you know, or just a more manageable line pressure for the regulators downstream. So I'll install a series regulator uh, to achieve that. And then the service pressure like your regulator is going to be provided by the gas company, uh, and that's the one that's going to be delivering the, uh, the supply pressure into your facility. So I created a arrangement, uh, just, a, just a generic arrangement of what these regulators may look like at a facility. So uh, on the far left side, we see that we've got line pressure of 60 PSI at the street. Uh, the service pressure regulator will reduce that, in this example, down to 15 PSI. And that would come into your building at 15 PSI. And then you may have a series pressure regulator where you want to reduce that down to 5 PSI before you bring it down to individual line pressure regulators. And then in this example, I've got three different burner applications. Each of them have a different outlet pressure requirement. So, you know, one may have two PSI uh, of outlet pressure needed. Another one may have one PSI, and another one would have uh, 15 inches of water column needed. Uh, so, um, we'll talk a little bit now about overpressure protection. All right. So, um, NFPA um, goes through and defines and and, and has uh, 
different requirements uh, to protect in the uh, in the case where you would have a failure of of, a, of any kind of given regulator. Uh, and so any of those regulators are, are prone to failure. Uh, you know whether it's a uh, a rupture in the diaphragm or, or, or anything getting locked up in that uh, valve body or any kind of a sensing line that may freeze up. Uh, you know, regulators can fail um, and so uh, the design and the selection of the components and the arrangement of the components is critical uh, to make sure that uh, in the case of a regulator failure that you do not create an upset condition or an unsafe condition in your system. So. Uh, they define that overpressure protection shall be provided in either of the following cases, either when the supply pressure exceeds the pressure rating of any downstream component, or when the regulator failure of a single upstream regulator, line regulator, or service pressure rega regulator results in a supply pressure exceeding the pressure rating of any downstream component. So what does this mean? If I go back to my previous example, um, we have 60 PSI of line pressure coming in, and if that service pressure like regulator were to fail, then we would now have potentially up to 60 PSI of pressure coming into the building. So whether it's in the design of that series pressure regulator, if that can handle the full 60 PSI coming in, great. If not, then you would either need to install uh, a monitoring regulator that we talked about earlier, or there's also um, uh, a couple of other devices that I list here on this next slide uh, that would allow you to uh, safely handle the excess pressure. Uh, so again, like I said, a series regulator in combination with a line regulator that will help balance everything out or just take that incoming pressure and but still monitor it and control it back down before it gets to the burner. Again, that monitoring regulator, um, a full capacity pressure relief valve is an option or an overpressure cutoff device. So, um, so the overpressure cutoff device would be some kind of a slam shut valve similar to the safety shutoff valve where as soon as high pressure is exceeded it just kills uh, the fuel supply to the entire system and so that, uh, so that again that's protecting the system downstream. A pressure relief valve uh, which, is, which is common, I, I see it from time to time, ultimately has, a, it's a mechanical device that has a fixed setting on it, whereas if you were to exceed that setting, it would then take the gas and just vent it up and out. Now, of course, that may not be a desirable failure method as it would, it would waste a lot of fuel, but again, the, the main purpose here is to prevent that fuel from getting into the chamber. Uh, and and they're, they're simple devices uh, to, to use um, it just needs to make sure that you have a full capacity, being able to handle the the full flow rating of the system, uh, and it needs to be vented, of course, to a safe uh, atmosphere or environment. Uh, some best practices that I've gone through in my experiences. Um, when I have a customer that's got a higher inlet pressure, and they want to bring that pressure down to a very low pressure. It's a pretty big change in, in, in relative percentage of, of inlet pressure to outlet pressure. I find that piloted regulators tend to work a lot better in these scenarios. Um, so the pilot regulator, as you can see in the diagram here, has a smaller uh, regulator that's on top of the existing regulator and there's an intermediate uh, pressure that is, is used within the regulator to help, um, to help adjust and respond to any kind of flow changes or pressure changes. It, they just seem to work a lot better. I, I've, I've used other regulators that have downstream sensing lines and they can be pretty tricky to adjust and set. Uh, there's a little bit of a lag or a delay in the downstream sensing to sense any flow changes and then tie that back into the regulator to make the proper adjustment. And sometimes that can cause some shock or some droop on the system when the shutoff valves are initially opened. Um, uh, so I like to use typically piloted regulators uh, for that purpose. And and uh, the other thing is that the uh, pilot regulators 
since they have internal sensing, um, you can keep the gas train compact in that you don't have to have a downstream sensing arrangement where typically that could be, I've seen up to the 10 or 12 pipe diameters downstream where they have to install that sensing line. It needs to be, uh, you know, continuous, uh, you know, same size as the, uh, as the regulator pipe um, downstream of the, of the of the regulator itself, so it, it, it you know those those are those regulators add some considerable length. So if you're looking at designing a train uh, and you have this um, scenario, I would look at number one, see if you can maybe have a, another series regulator upstream of that to bring the pressure down to a more reasonable uh, level. Uh, but uh, if not, um, it you know instead of using two regulators, you can use one piloted regulator, and that would allow you to uh, to get you know, a, a get get that larger step down in pressure while maintaining uh, reliable, repeatable, and and fast responding uh, flow and pressure changes. Um, another best practice that I have is the adjustment strings on these regulators are usually at a minimal cost. They're usually less than fifty or hundred dollars each. Um, so when I'm when I'm doing a system or I'm looking at supplying a, a fuel train. Uh, I usually always supply just extra springs just to make sure that if they need to increase or decrease beyond what they anticipate the outlet pressure is, um, you know that 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 they're safe there. Um, also, another uh, it's not a best practice; it's actually a code requirement. Um, if you got a regulator that you need to have a vent connection tied to, um, the the code and, and there's some additional information within the code. I, it was too long to type out here, but uh, you can couple, as long as it's seeing the same line pressure, you can couple multiple regulator vents together, uh, but you cannot tie a regulator vent into the discharge of a vent valve. Um, so I'm just going to show here, uh, here's our diagram again, and I show um, what, what the venting you know, may look like. So I've got two separate vents coming out of this fuel train. I have uh, two vents being uh, for the regulators tied together into a common vent, and then I have the separate um, vent uh, between my uh, two blocking valves on my main line going out uh, in its own vent. I have been to customer sites where I've seen this kind of arrangement where they say, well, a vent is a vent is a vent, so I can tie my regulator vents in with the, um, with the shutoff valve vent, and that's a big no-no. Uh, if you look at this Diagram, you can see that um, if you've got um, if you got a regulator that were to rupture or fail, you could ultimately backload through the vent valve and bypass that first primary shutoff valve. Uh, now you've got that secondary valve there to to help you out, but you see you're already bypassing a shutoff valve potentially in this arrangement. So that's a big no-no. So we want to uh, make sure that if you Got uh, got an application where you're looking to do some venting that you make sure that you have separate vent lines uh, for your regulators and for the shutoff valves. Uh, same, of course, also goes for uh, the use of a pressure relief valve, right? So we talked about for over protection, uh, using a pressure relief valve, uh, you would need to vent that, that out separately from as well. Uh, so the next component that we'll talk about are fuel pressure switches. Uh, I have them highlighted here. Uh, we've got two of them in this picture. And uh, NFPA has a, a little bit of a different definition between the low and the high. Uh, so the low pressure switch or sensor shall be provided and be interlocked to the burner management system. That's clear enough. Uh, they do have an extra requirement for the high fuel pressure switch that in addition to it being interlocked to the burner management system, you also want to have it located downstream of your final pressure reducing regulator. And I'll show you in the, in the diagram on the next slide that, uh, you know, of course this makes sense because my pressure regulator is reducing my pressure down to a usable pressure for the burner. If that regulator were to fail, um, I would see an excess of pressure downstream of that regulator, but I may not necessarily see an increase of pressure on the upstream side of that regulator. So the high gas pressure switch needs to be located downstream of that final pressure reducing regulator to capture the, uh, the failure of that regulator. And then the uh, settings shall be made into accordance with the operating limits of the burner system, right? So uh, 
depending upon the type of burner that you're using and the capacities that you're looking to achieve, you want to make sure that your pressure switch covers that range, right? So if I have a burner that requires 10 inches of water column, my pressure switch needs to be able to be adjusted uh, above and beyond 10 inches. So here, uh, here's my diagram again. And I labeled the low and the high fuel pressure uh, switches. So, and again, the best practice from what I've seen is to put this low fuel pressure switch also downstream of the final pressure re regulator, but you need to have that upstream of the primary shutoff valve. The reason is, is because if you tried to put this low, low fuel pressure switch downstream of that primary shutoff valve, but well, when the system slams shut and closed, you may not be reading any line pressure downstream of that uh, shutoff valve. So your low fuel pressure switch, which is a normally open switch, will be open. And when you try to light the burner off again, you're not going to be able to, um, to, to fire the burner off because your low fuel pressure switch is not uh, engaged. Um, it's also good practice to put it downstream of the of the of the um, of that final pressure regulator. The code doesn't specify it, but we, we feel that it's best practice to, to put that down there. You're knocking your fuel pressure down uh, with your regulator, and ultimately, low fuel pressure is a, is a safety that's in place to make sure that your pressure doesn't go too low. So, if there was somebody that maybe came in and made an adjustment on that fuel pressure regulator uh, and adjusted that down to an unsafe condition where it could cause the burner to light off or maybe create high CO because your burner is running lean, the low fuel pressure switch wouldn't be able to, to detect that if it was located upstream of that pressure regulator. So that's why we like to keep that downstream of the pressure regulator. And then the high fuel pressure switch, we want that downstream of all the shutoff valves. Um, as well as the as the final pressure regulator. And again, another best practice. Uh, it's my personal preference. This is just my personal preference to use a manual reset fuel pressure switch, uh, unless the fuel train is difficult to access. You know, sometimes I see some of these fuel trains that are mounted up kind of high, or maybe there's a lot of other piping or components that are maybe in the way. Um, and then the other reason why I wouldn't use it is that if the burner management system has a first out enunciation. So in my many years in my previous life when I was uh, commissioning combustion systems, and commissioning is the key word because I haven't gone through yet and, and honed in and dialed in on the pressure settings for the burner and for the regulator. Um, but one of the more annoying things that, that's happened to me, and I'm sure some of you guys have experienced this on the line, is that when you go to start up your burner for the first time, um, and then uh, as soon as you energize those shutoff valves, maybe a second or two later, the system shuts you down. Um, and if you have an automatic reset pressure switch, it happens in the in, in microseconds. Where, for instance, on the low gas pressure switch, once you start energizing and opening those shutoff valves, you'll see an initial dip in your fuel pressure because you're now introducing that gas downstream of the shutoff valve. Well, if that dip is goes low enough to the point where it cuts off your low gas pressure switch, that'll communicate to the burner management system, I have a failure, I need to shut you down. So then it'll de-energize the shutoff valve. And then as soon as the valve slams shut, you build up that line pressure again in the, in the line upstream of the shutoff valve downstream of the pressure regulator to the point now where your low gas pressure switch is satisfied again. So if you don't have an enunciator um, and you don't physically see or hear that switch break and make again, it could be maddening trying to figure out what caused you to shut down. A manual reset switch, would you would go through and depress the button, and if you hear it click or you hear the system reset, you at least know that, hey, I've lost my low gas pressure switch. I need to make an adjustment to my regulator. I need to change the range on that low gas pressure switch. So a burner management system that uses first out enunciation is going to tell you, hey, you lost on low gas. You lost on high gas. Um, so that's why I typically like a manual reset switch uh, for that case. 
And then uh, as far as adjusting and setting those switches, uh, I usually go 20% above and below the setting at which the uh, system trips off. So I usually perform this after I've, uh, when I was setting up burner systems, after I established the pressure that I needed at the burner and I, and I made my characterization, characterizations of the gas valve downstream, I would then go back and then set my dial in and set my low and high fire switches. So uh, what I typically do is while the burner is at low fire, I would then go through and test the high fire switch. And the reason for that is with the burner at low fire, I usually have my gas control valve that's located downstream of the fuel train, uh, probably either just before or maybe in certain cases right at the burner. Um, when the burner's at low fire, you're going to have a higher buildup of static and pressure and dynamic pressure in the line. So therefore, my pressure uh, in the line with the system running is going to be the highest when my burner's at low fire. So this is the point where I want to go through and make my adjustments on the high fuel pressure switch. So usually when I'm setting the burner system up, I'll have the, I'll have the switch set at a, at a high enough setting that will allow me to, to, to make my adjustments. And then I'll gradually bring it down until the system trips off. I'll make a mark or a note of what that pressure was, and then I'll go 20% above that uh, for, for a setting on that high gas pressure switch. So I show here in the example, if I do that and the switch trips that 10 inches water column, then I'll set the switch for 12 inches of water column. And then the reverse is the true for the low. I bring the burner up to high fire, and uh, I'll set the low fuel pressure switch uh, until it trips, and then I'll note the setting, and then I'll adjust it to 20% below. Uh, so again, if the switch trips at 10, to 10 inches, then I'll set the switch for uh, 8 inches. Typically, when you're setting your low gas pressure switch, you need to do that a little bit quicker because you have to keep in mind with the burner manually set at high fire that you're introducing quite a bit of heat in your chamber, and you want to make sure that uh, uh, you're keeping an eye on that to, to make sure things don't get too out of control there. Now, um, there are some instances where you may want to consider the use of a time delay on a pressure switch. And the code actually does have specifications for this. Uh, so you can see here in this document that it, it, the code says that it will not prohibit, which means allow, roughly, a time delay um, uh, to the action of a pressure proving, which we're talking about a pressure switch, uh, or flow or proof of closure switch where the following conditions exist. So there is an operational need demonstrated for the time delay. The use of a time delay is approved. The time delay feature is not adjustable beyond five seconds. And a single time delay does not serve more than one pressure proving or flow proving device. And the time from an abnormal pressure or flow condition until a holding medium is removed from the safety shutoff valve does not exceed five seconds. So what they're saying here is that there are some cases out there where maybe it's during, and most of the time this happens during the main flame establishment period, right? This is a critical time for our fuel train where, um, where we're en energizing the main fuel shutoff valves. Our pressure regulators are now starting to see flow moving through them. And if you monitor pressure and you watch these uh, systems run, a lot of times you'll see, if you've got gauges on your gas train, you'll see them momentarily um, spike and go high, or they'll momentarily drop and go low until the regulator has a chance to be able to adjust uh, to the valves opening and then maintain a constant pressure. Well, again, from my experience, I've been in some applications where either the, um, the regulator that was used or the, uh, the distance between the fuel trains and the burners were such that there was a very large pressure swing upon the valves energizing, and this caused many headaches because it would kick off your low or your high gas pressure switch. So, um, so NFPA will allow you to put a time delay in there. Uh, so that would just, and again, just, it just has to meet these requirements. Um, and again, it can't exceed five seconds. Five seconds is a critical time frame uh, in, in all of NFPA. You'll see that repeated, and I'll mention it again a little bit later, um, in that they feel like if, if you're introducing fuel for more than five seconds in an unsafe 
manner or you're or you're temporarily bypassing a safe they they don't they don't want it to to happen for for more than five seconds. So um, now uh, you can simply use uh, uh, a, a a fixed time delay unit that would be wired um, in uh, around kind of latch around the pressure switch that would then open up once the regulator has a chance to respond and 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 normalize and you're good. Uh, another practice that I have seen is the use of a snubber. So a snubber is looks just like a um, a, a gas nipple uh, or you know like a pipe nipple, um, but uh, and, and there's various different kinds. But the one that I've seen uh, is from Weica, and it's a uh, sintered metal snubber where it almost looks like kind of like a porous sponge or like a metal kind of uh, um, lattice work on the inside. And ultimately, what that does is it allow it slows down the any kind of momentary spikes or drip or, or trips from getting up into the pressure switch. So, um, so this is a mechanical fix. So you wouldn't have to go through and use uh, any kind of time delay or redo any of the programming in your uh, burner management system. Um, but it will, uh, in certain circumstances, um, do the trick for um, keeping that. Uh, keeping that pressure switch uh, maintained at least for m no more than five seconds uh, in in a, in a momentary upset condition. All right, so now we're going to move on uh, to safety shutoff valves. So of course, uh, this is the most critical component or components in any fuel train. That's why they have two of them in 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 redundancy. Um, so they define this as a normally closed valve installed in the piping that closes automatically to shut off the fuel, atmosphere, gas, or oxygen in the event of abnormal conditions during shutdown. All right, and it's so critical that they want you to have two of them. Uh, there are um, a number of requirements for these shutoff valves, and uh, one of them is having some kind of local visual position indication, and uh, they they make a distinction here that. Um, they want to see this for any burners or pilots that are in excess of 150,000 BTUs per hour. Um, we use quite a bit of ASCO in, in, in pilots, and, and a lot of those ASCOs are just the simple solenoids that don't have any kind of visual indication. But usually these are on pilot lines that are maybe 20, 30, 40,000 BTUs per hour. So the code says, yep, you can continue to use those for your smaller pilots, but once you get above 150,000, um, they at least want to see some kind of a visual indication on that valve. Um, there's also another requirement saying that where a safety shutoff valve is required to be proved closed, the following should apply. And uh, the first item says that a proof closed condition shall be accomplished by either of the following means, which is a proof of closure switch incorporated in a listed safety shutoff valve assembly in accordance with the terms of the listing or a valve proving system. So I'm going to get into both of those. Uh, I'll get into the proof of closure switch now, and then I'll talk a little bit more about valve proving a little bit later. Now the um, now the auxiliary and closed position indicator switches shall not satisfy the proved closed requirement of the above. So that a lot of people uh, that I've that I've talked to are a little confused on that because. Ultimately, you're saying that, hey, if I've got a switch in my valve that says that my valve is closed, is that not proof of closure? And it may or may not be. So what a proof of closure switch is, is, a, is it, it has a certain amount of over travel that makes that switch. So not only is the valve closed, but the valve body or the mechanism actually moves uh, a certain percentage beyond closed to make that proof of closure switch. And again, you're going to want to contact the manufacturer of your shutoff valve to make sure that they're, that the switch that's provided is, is in fact a proof of closure switch or just a closed position indicator switch. So uh, here at Lessman we work a lot with Honeywell. They have um, 40, 55 actuators and 50, 55 valve bodies. And depending upon which actuator that you have, you can have one that has an auxiliary switch, which you can set up to be an open or closed switch. But that does not satisfy the requirement of a proof of closure switch. You would have to go with one of the models that's 
specifically says proof of closure switch and the valve body that actually has that other cam that would make once the valve goes slightly past the closed position. So it says that when is it required? Well, um, it, based on the code requirements, when you've got a burner capacity of the main or the pilot and it exceeds 400,000 BTUs per hour, at least one of those safety shutoff valves between the burner and the fuel supply shall be proof closed. All right, so you don't necessarily need it on both. Um, you only need to have it on one by the code requirements, but typically when I've got a burner system that's over 400,000, I'm usually matching the shutoff valves like for like, so I'm, I'm doing two of the same shutoff valves. So if um, if I need visual indication and proof of closure, I'll, I'll put that on both. And what I usually do is I'll wire those two proof of closure switches in series with each other to prove that both valves are closed. It's a little extra step above and beyond the requirements, but uh, just uh, it's, a, it's another safety le measure that I recommend taking. Um, there's also a couple of other requirements as far as the performance of the safety shutoff valves. Uh, they have to close within one second or less upon being de-energized. That's why you see a lot of these uh, combustion rated safety shutoff valves have very large return springs and some of them have a very audible uh, clunking or closing sound that you can hear it from quite far away. And um, NFP actually actually makes a very interesting uh, distinction here. If there is a safety shutoff valve that exceeds one second, um, it allows you to do that, but the combined time for safety shutoff valve closure and flame failure response shall not exceed five seconds. So there, there's our five seconds again. Uh, so what does this mean? Um, if you are, if you look at the burner management and you look at the flame failure response time on your flame amplifier cards or, um, or some, um, some enhanced scanner products or flame safety products maybe have adjustable flame failure response times, um, you're going to be very hard pressed to find any product that's going to allow you to go more than three or four seconds uh, for that flame failure response time because they, need, they know that, hey, the code's going to you need to prove it closed in five seconds. Um, and if the valve closes in one second or less, you know, you don't really want to extend your flame failure response time beyond four seconds. Otherwise, you're going to get pretty close to that five second limit. Um, so another practice that I see with regard to wiring of the safety shutoff valves are cascading valves. So whether or not you should cascade or not cascade, um, so what a cascading is is when you energize valves in a sequence instead of energizing them all together. So if I have a block and bleed arrangement where I have a vent valve and two blocking valves, I'll typically energize the vent valve first, the primary valve second, and then that secondary valve last. Um, so this helps in applications where instead of energizing all those valves together and, and introducing all that fuel at once, um, you kind of gradually step that fuel down in through the gas train by opening up that primary shutoff valve first. That maybe gives the regulator a little bit of time to, uh, uh, to open up and respond at least to that first shutoff valve um, and then open up that second one a little bit later. It just kind of helps ease the gas into the system. Um, another thing that this does um, is it limits the current draw through the burner management system. So during that opening cycle where you're energizing uh, on a motorized shutoff valve, you're energizing both the holding solenoid and the motor operator times three, that could be quite the current draw through uh, through your flame safeguard. Of course, you're going to want to make sure that you're not exceeding any kind of amperage ratings on those terminals. Uh, so what sometimes people will do is cascade to, uh, to, to keep that current draw down. Uh, the, one, the one downside that I think of cascading is that because you're delaying the, you know, you're staggering the valves, you're delaying the fuel from getting to the burner, and um, in and, and, and all combustion applications, you have a limited window, it's usually about 10 seconds, for you to introduce the main fuel to the burner system. So if you cascade the valves and your valves have a longer opening time, you just have to keep that in mind because uh, you could be getting up to the point where just as that second valve is opening and just as you start introducing fuel to the burner, you may be reaching the end of your um, of your flame establishment period. Uh, so 
again, I just mentioned quickly block and bleed. So I show two examples here in my diagram. So what I consider double block is what we see on the pilot line where you have two normally closed valves in series with each other. And then the block and bleed arrangement uh, has a vent valve that is located between the two blocking valves. Um, this type of arrangement is, is fairly common in larger combustion systems. Um, but um, and, and the purpose of the block and bleed is that if you've got a failure in that first primary shutoff valve, and gas happens to get past it, well, the fuel is going to take the path of least resistance. So if you have a normally open vent valve, it's going to go up and out that vent and be vented safely away than trying to get past the second shutoff valve and into the, to the furnace. Um, we're starting to see less and less of these, um, and people are starting to favor more of the valve proving system. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that now. So. Uh, the NFPA defines it as a system used to check the closure of safety shutoff valves by detecting leakage. So what a valve proving system does is it actually replaces the vent valve in a block and bleed arrangement with a valve proving pressure switch. So um, this changes a little bit on how you wire the valves and what kind of, um, what kind of flame safeguard or, or PLC program that you use uh, because you're actually energizing the valves separately off of separate terminals to perform this uh, uh, valve proving test. Now, a big note that I wanted to, to make clear is that the valve proving system does not replace the need for the annual seat leakage testing. That still needs to be done. The benefit of valve proving is it gives you early indication that you may have a, a, a leaky valve. So I'm just going to go through real quick a, um, a, a typical valve proving sequence post run mode, right? So I'm in run mode right now. Anything that's highlighted red or orange is going to be in contact or touching the fuel. So I've got the pilot turned off and I got my main fuel on. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to shut the burner safely down and initiate the valve proving sequence. So the first thing that we do is we actually shut off the upstream valve um, that, that shuts off the gas supply to the, uh, to the burner. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to leave the second downstream valve energized. So, um, so that's just going to purge not only just all the gas and that's going to burn out all the gas into the burner, going into the burner, but it's also going to purge any kind of pressure buildup that would normally be between those two shutoff valves. And then what I'll do, and then what the valve proving system does, is it actually shuts that second valve off, and then it pauses and waits for a certain period of time. And that time is going to be based on a formula that you would use uh, to calculate the volume of gas that's trapped between those two shutoff valves. And if there was a leak that's greater than 1.76 cubic feet per hour, you have to go through and use this formula to determine how long you would need to pause and wait in order for your, um, in order for that pressure switch to detect that level of leakage. So if both of the shutoff valves are turned off, and I know that I purged the pressure between the two shutoff valves, but during that time period I see the state of that pressure switch change, then that means that my upstream valve has a leak, and then that valve would need to be replaced, or you need to just double check and make sure that you've got the proper settings for your valve leak test procedure. So it tests that upstream valve first, and then you can also test then the downstream valve immediately after that. So what we do here is we just energize that first shutoff valve, and that would allow you to bring that line pressure between the two valves in question. And then after I energize that valve, I'm again going to shut that valve off, and then I will pause, and I will wait. And so right now, it should hold that line pressure between those two shutoff valves if my downstream valve is, is working. But if that line pressure were to drop below, then that would be an indication that maybe my downstream valve is not working. Um, now, Honeywell makes enhanced flame safeguards that have the ability of setting up valve proving so again, you have to wire it differently. You have to wire the main, the, the primary valve or the upstream valve and the secondary valve 
on separate terminals as well as wire in your, your pressure switch. And then um, through the keyboard display, you can actually set up when you want the system to check the valve proving. You can actually have it test it out before you go through a run cycle. So before your call for heat, before your purge, it would go through and, and work through the valve proving sequence. Or you can have it do it after, or you can have it do it both, or you can split and have one valve tested before and the other valve tested after. So they give you um, different options on when you can and how you can perform that valve uh, proving test. And of course, you would need the keyboard display because you need to input the, the time durations for for the uh, not only for the opening cycle for each valve, but also for the time period that you have to wait and pause between um, you know, while you're testing the valves. And again, um, this automatically the benefits of the valve proving system is it's an automatic check that you can use in addition between your annual leak testing, right? So if something happens suddenly, you don't have to wait and discover that until you do your annual leak test. That valve proving system will tell you ahead of time. Uh, it removes the vent line from the equation. So, um, you know, there's there's cost that's associated with that vent valve as well as all of the piping uh, to go out and, and run that vent piping out. There's also a potential hazard if you don't do that vent valve properly, you could be venting it to an unsafe location. Um, but if you also have a failure in that vent valve, that can sometimes go undetected. And I have seen that in certain cases because these vents are vented up and out, usually out the roof. To a safe area, so usually there's not people around there to detect any kind of gas that may be leaking. Um, and when a vent valve fails, you could still be providing adequate fuel to the burner system through the main uh, shutoff valves that still satisfy your flame safeguard. Like yes, I still see flame. I haven't exceeded uh, or, or gone below any of my pressure switch settings, and you're at the whole time you're 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 venting uh, gas up and out the uh, uh, out the roof. So um, that's why a lot of people, if, if they've experienced that problem, uh, they see that using a valve proving system uh, is, is a good thing to have. And again, you, you have to have the proper flame safeguard or PLC programming to, to activate the valve proving sequence. Um, the, the final topic that I'd like to cover is just, I want to, again, just go over the leak testing of the shutoff valves. You know, these are the most critical components within any kind of fuel train. Um, NFPA dictates that you need to have the means of going through and testing these gas shutoff valves, um, it, you know, it, it really is cumbersome and and uh, and, and really not uh, practical to have to pull all of your valves out of the line and, and, and do leak testing on a bench. So um, a lot of these valves now have built-in test ports uh, on them, either upstream or downstream, that you can tie into for doing the, uh, the, uh, the leak testing. If your valve does not have to do that, the code here, 8.2.3, says that it has to be installed. So what that would mean is that you'd have to install some kind of a, a like a, a T with a little you know, quarter inch test connection uh, upstream or downstream of that valve if, if the valve doesn't have a test port uh, handy. A typical valve seat leakage test procedure is that you would apply line pressure to the upstream side of the de-energized valve. And then downstream, you would isolate uh, any kind of volume downstream. So that's either energizing a vent valve so that it's now closed, and you've got that uh, you know, sealed off, or you can use a manual shutoff valve if it's immediately downstream of that device uh, to close that off. Right? We want to we want to be able to if there's any kind of leaks, we want it to be able to be in a closed volume so that when we hook up our our tubing for our test connection, that any of the uh, bubbles will go out the tubing. Uh, we then go through and um, hook up uh, a quarter-inch tubing and put that into a small pool of water, usually some kind of a bucket or a cup, and he just would put that in just to break the surface, and then if there's any leaks, you'll start to see bubbles uh, coming out of that tubing. Um, what you'd want to do is you want to actually count the number of bubbles that are coming out per minute. Um, there are actually allowable seat leakage rates depending upon the size of the valve and the manufacturer of the valve and any kind of um, authority having jurisdictions. Um, they may have more stringent or less stringent seat leakage rates. Um, ultimately, you want to contact them and the manufacturer to see what actually is allowable. We would, of course, like to see zero leakage, but uh, uh, they do allow for a certain number. So if there's one or two bubbles, it may not be 
uh, that big of a deal. But uh, I've seen some valves where as soon as I put it in, I put the uh, tubing in the water, it looks like a, a jet boat is uh, starting to take off. So um, I'm also going to go through, we're going to link this um, presentation onto our training website. And I will also put a link to Maxon's leak testing procedure. They have a very detailed leak testing procedure. Um, so if you guys aren't familiar with that, uh, I'll link to that, uh, uh, to that procedure uh, for your reference. Um, so again, we want to test these valves usually in line just because just from an ease standpoint, you can bench test them, but you know, you're going to have to take the valve out and put it back in. But it's also good just because this is the environment that the valves are in. These are the pressures that the valve is normally seeing. So we want to uh, test these in, in line if possible. Now, we have to test the valve while it's de-energized. And in certain uh, instances, like for a double block arrangement, you can easily test that first valve out because that valve's de-energized. The second valve's de-energized. You've got your downstream volume requirement all squared away. Um, but when you test out that second valve, you have to somehow energize the first valve, but keep the second valve de-energized. Usually these are wired together. Um, so what sometimes I'll see is that uh, um, some people that are designing trains and they want to make it easy for leak testing is that they'll have a uh, junction box, which would have a, a two-way selector switch that would allow them to run a maintenance mode where you can energize um, the upstream valve uh, separately. Uh, same goes for the block and bleed arrangement. Again, it just gets a little bit tricky because you're going to need to de-energize that vent valve. Or sorry, you're going to want to energize rather than vent valve so that it goes closed. And then you're going to want to, when you test that second valve downstream, you want to keep that valve energized as well as energize the first valve but keep that second valve uh, de-energized. So um, again, there's, there's creative wiring that you can do. The code allows for it as long as it's... Uh, a, a maintenance mode, uh, either it's a, uh, whether it's a keyed switch or some kind of a two-way switch, um, it, you know, it wouldn't allow if somebody accidentally left it in maintenance, mo maintenance mode, it wouldn't allow for the system to go back up and running in that state. Um, and, uh, and so they, it allows you to go through and create a uh, kind of a special uh, operating uh, condition where you can just energize those valves for your leak test. Um, some people also go through these manual isolation valves are, are optional. They're not a code requirement. You can have as many of them in there as you want. And sometimes what people will do just to ensure uh, that they're running properly or that it's easy to test, they'll just put isolation valves downstream of those upstream valves uh, just to uh, make it easy to do the leak testing. Uh, the one thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to not put that manual isolation valve physically in the vent line if you've got a block and bleed arrangement, because that's a big no-no. You can leave that closed, and that defeats the whole purpose. So that covers everything that I wanted to talk about today. Again, I thank you guys for your time, and I open this up for any questions that you guys may have. AJ, thank you very much for your presentation. While we're waiting for some questions, if, uh, if you can't think of your questions and uh, would like to have your specific application reviewed, please feel free to give us a call at 800-9-LESSMAN or 800-953-7626. If you don't know your account manager, uh, feel free to ask for me, Mike DeLaCluse, or AJ, and uh, we'll make sure that you get taken care of. Uh, if you want to know about more of the technologies we supply, please follow us on social media. Dan's blog is very active, has tons of great trick tips. They're all practical, and they're all boiled down to the simplest uh, level so that uh, even I can understand them. All of our webinars are posted uh, both on our website and on our Lessman Instrument Company YouTube channel. Uh, if you want to know when something new is posted, you can follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, next month, our topic uh, is going to be presented by Siemens Mark Klee. Uh, Mark is going to help you understand how to select the correct radar level gauge. Uh, if you've had to select a radar level uh, piece of instrumentation lately, you've probably discovered that there are lots of different technologies now available and lots of different antennas. Uh, Mark's going to help you understand which one is best for your application.
uh, as you can see there on the screen, uh, the webinar is going to be held on March 17th at 9 a.m. Announcements uh, and sign-up will be coming shortly. We don't have any questions, AJ. You must have answered them all. All right, good. I'm glad I got you guys all squared away. Uh, again, if you do think of a question that you'd like answered, please look up myself or AJ, and we'll make sure that we get you taken care of. At this point, since there are no further questions, our presentation will conclude. Thank you all very much for your time, and thank you for attending.